$600,000, you know, $600,000 check in his pocket and nobody will lend to him because this is 2010 and this is at the height of the banking freakout after the meltdown, the meltdown 08, 09, and nobody's talking to anybody. The best we can do by 2011 is there are commercial lenders out there that if we want to get together this portfolio of a million dollars, they'll lend to us 65%. So Al's like, well, what if I buy a million dollars of property and then we get, we'll, we'll talk. And ultimately that bank went out of business. So, and it was, it was impossible. I networked and networked and networked and I was on the phone and I talked to 20 different banks in Phoenix that I was told were all investor friendly, that were all real estate focused and none of them would do any deals. And then it was things of the starting to light, lighten up in Minneapolis and there are three banks down there that are real estate investor friendly and they will in fact now finally start talking about lending on properties that the owners are not occupying. Because that was always a big one. Hey, you, can, you can get a house, sure we'll lend you up because you're going to live in it, right? Um, well, then we won't lend you. And we're Canadians, so that was that was another deal. How can we get after you? How can we, what's our recourse against the Canadian? We don't know how to, a lot of these banks are small. They're not, they're not like TD and Scotiabank. They're far more similar to your credit unions. There's there's a staff of 30 people. There's, there's nobody on their staff that knows how to go after somebody who lives in another country if they default on their mortgage. Or if they have a renter in, in there that's wrecking the house and owner's absent. Yes, Ed. Question for you and your friend Al. He's got that six hundred grand in his pocket. Yeah. But you said the bank went under not long after you so say he would have done all that with the bank and he goes under. What happens to his stability financially? Well, if he was like leveraged to the hilt on those kind of, yeah. Yeah, he'd have to dump like yeah. he'd have to dump you know, if he had if he had done what we were planning on doing, yank three quarters of his, sorry, two thirds of his money out, so commercial lending, commercial ratios, 65%, he would have taken 65% of his money out, bought, you know, taken six properties mm -hmm. and basically made it 18 properties. He would have been forced then to turn around and sell 12 of them. Mm -hmm. And if he was having to sell them distressed, chances are he had to sell 15 to get yeah. enough money to cover. So yeah, he could have gotten hosed. So here the, I guess the, the point is, how can you, as an investor, with that situation in mind, guard against a weak bank structure there? Well, interestingly, I go in to, to talk to a banker in Minneapolis. And it's the first time I've ever had this, because I've only been used to dealing with bankers in Canada, where we come in to the banker. Please, please. <laughs> you know, uh, and and we, we come in literally genuflecting and saying, <laughs> here's all my financial stuff and I have good credit and, and like like the ladies were saying, it's like you have to be presenting so much to your to your A-level lenders. To walk into a bank, have the guy, you know, and I hand him my card, and up here, it's like, I've had an MBA for 10 years, it wasn't really like that big a deal. The one thing I would say it's useful for is impressing American bankers. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, crap, the guy's like, MBA? So our bank has $400 million to lend right now, and we just got bought by this state bank, and we're about to have $2 billion for, and it's like the guy's trying to sell me a car, <laughs> right? It's like, it was a really nice feeling to finally have somebody try and sell me. So yeah, how you guard against it is you actually, you actually um, ask the questions of the bank. How many branches do you have? How much do you have? What's your portfolio? What type of properties are you lending on? So you actually interview the bank and you come at them from a position of strength. And it's a very different feeling from, from how we normally deal with up here where obviously no one here would think about worrying about TD going under. You know, it's that whole too big to fail. And you wouldn't think about down there Wells or, or well, maybe you know, up until the meltdown, we wouldn't think of a Wells or a Chase City, City Group, oh, yeah. Chase Manhattan going under. Now we have to actually take that a little bit seriously, but it's easier to deal with when you're dealing with a state bank, state bank in Minnesota. And the nice thing about state bank in Minnesota, or even a smaller bank than that, is that you know I'm dealing with a bank that's got three branches, and I'm looking to buy a property just over there. Guy who works at the bank drives just over there, and he lives just over there, and 
they care about that. So, yeah, if I find the right bank, it's actually going to be a right situation. It's going to be win-win. They actually want to see me buying a dilapidated home, buying a foreclosure, a place that's possibly boarded up or was bank-owned or had a bad renter in it and it's beat down. They want to see me go in there, renovate it, and put a nice, stable, stabilize the sure. situation. So it can actually work really well. You're right. You have to actually protect yourself. You, mm -hmm. you don't just borrow money from anyone that will lend it to you. It's an interesting situation that we would never think of as Canadians. But you do have to be aware of that in the States. Don't just take money just because they're willing to give it to you. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> you know? Um, so anyway, that, that was like what I found in the States was that they, they, had, uh, they weren't willing to lend. Eventually, this last time I was in, in talking to the banks in the spring in Minneapolis, they are willing to now start lending to, uh, to Canadians who have entities. <coughs> so the long, dark winter is over. As of you know, the last four or five months, they will now lend to people like us who go down there and set up a corporation and a structure and protect ourselves against liability and taxes, and we want to buy property. And now there are some banks at the local level that will talk to people like us. Uh, the one thing being, you're still going to need to put a personal guarantee on it. Now, the reason we haven't actually refinanced our Minneapolis properties is one of my partners, <coughs> John, is conservative and doesn't want to put a personal guarantee on that. So he's willing to wait for our properties to season and get HELOCs on them. And that's fine with me. I mean, you know, we have to wait a little bit longer. And a HELOC meaning a home equity line of credit. So once our properties, we've owned them for a long enough period of time to meet the bank stipulations, they'll give us a line of credit on it instead of doing a refinance. That means that it's based on the value of the property and we won't get quite as much money, but it means there's no recourse against us, the owners. So if anything were to happen, if we were to default on it, their only recourse was against the property. Yes, Karen. Um, what, do you know what the normal length of time is for seasoning to be able to do that? Depends on the lender who you're, uh, who you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, we dealt with Wells because Kyle uh, traveled a lot for business and liked to have a Wells that he could pop into to do a closing, to do his banking anywhere in the U.S. And at the time, Wells actually, there was a Wells just down the street from where I worked in Mississauga when we were setting all this up. Shortly thereafter, Wells, kind of all their branches shut down. Uh, Wells pulled out of Canada. But um, seasoning was with them uh, a year. You know, and it was a year of rent, a year of rent returns mm -hmm. for everything. Mm -hmm. So um, at this point in time, we were, you know, we have one property that's at a year. We have another one that's almost at a year. And then Colfax, well, obviously we have still got about six months to go on that one. So we're at six. The other thing was that just given the small amounts of money, I mean, we bought all cash. This place was frankly inexpensive. It didn't make a lot of sense for us to go out there and, you know, do a 50% HELOC on a $22,000 house. It's like it's 11 grand, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, but when we can do all three of them, plus as the values keep going up too, mm -hmm. that $22,000 condo is going to be a $40,000 condo pretty quick, and we'll be able to pull out all of the money that we put into it. Mm -hmm. You know, but it was just a case of you know, waiting, waiting for the you know, right time and. Also, too, it's like John's a busy guy. He's working, you know, RBC Global Insurance. I'm flipping seven houses in Winnipeg simultaneously. It's like, good lord, like, there's not a lot of time necessarily to be on the phone. So sometimes the US stuff gets pushed to the back burner to deal with getting this half million dollar house on the market, you know, in Winnipeg. So I can make some more money. So I can buy some more stuff with cash. Yeah, so. And meanwhile, they're sending you $900. Yeah, exactly. It's like I feel guilty, but I hadn't checked my Wells Fargo online bank account in a long time, and I looked. I was like, "Oh crap! I've got a lot of money in there." It's like <laughs> I've got almost enough money to buy half a condo now. It's like, and it's just been building up. And I mean, when we bought Kofax, I mean, we bought Kofax. We were like down to like nothing. Like we tapped out that account again to buy. So as it builds up, as soon as it gets to the level, we'll start writing more offers, and we'll. 
buy another one. It's sort of been self, it's been slow and self-sustaining. I mean, I know we could, we could ramp things up. We could get more joint venture partners. We could get RSP mortgages. These are all on my list of things to do. But I'm human, and you know, stuff, you know, <laughs> stuff doesn't you always get prioritized how it should. Yeah, and, and I mean, I know a lot of you out there, it's the same thing. You'll be like competing priorities, day jobs, all these different things, and it's hard necessarily sometimes to get started or to take the next step. If you want to go into the US, it can be really daunting unless you just go out and buy something in your own name. You know, or there's other, you can even try flipping a house in the States, but then you have to rely on contractors and distance, and, and we talk about horror stories. <coughs> there's some nice people that I met on a course in uh, Los Angeles. They had a property in Indianapolis that they had bought sight unseen off the web. And they were willing to sell it to me. They had just had it, they had had the renovations done, and for some reason they were just like, they were out of it. They were sick of it. They'd had all kinds of contractor problems, and they just, they were willing to sell it to me 100% financed. They'd carry the whole thing. They'll just do a BTV 